Hey, what's up, everyone? You're currently tuned into TBD on KCSBFM 91.9 in Santa Barbara and netnetradio.com, Tijuana. Today, Lai Talk and I are joined by Lincoln, Nebraska music librarian, Timbal Tapes label proprietor, and functioning compositional whiz kid, Scott Scholes. Scott's a regional maverick in the Nebraska scene, curating music and special, special interest library programming while also recording his own compositions. Scott's latest Whip Sigils is out now on CD from the No Part of It Bandcamp. How's it going, Scott? Well, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, it's going great. Sick, dude. We're stoked to have you on. Uh, what have you been up to recently? Anything like outside of music? Like, do you have any like hobbies or like? Oh my gosh. Um, you know, I don't have many hobbies outside of music. It's pretty, it's pretty heavily music. <laughs> yeah. Get it. What has what has the year been music wise for you or kind of scene wise in Nebraska out there in Lincoln? Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, you know, the Nebraska scene kind of waxes and wanes a little bit. Uh-huh. Um I know like I know you y'all had uh Marsha Fisher on a, a yeah. while back. I I yeah. caught that show too. Um Sick. you know, I do um I miss Marsha being in town. Um Gosh, she she has had so many cool projects going on, hosted some of the coolest house shows I've ever been to in my life. Uh-huh. Um, but there are still some cool folks doing things around here. Um, like uh Plaque Blake is is still in based in Lincoln anyway. I think right now he's on tour. I think he was in Chicago last night. That's sick. Um Darren Keene just moved to Chicago, but he's been in Nebraska for the last uh, I think two or three years now, uh doing some pretty cool stuff. Um yeah, so there there are still some things going on. Um at the music library, I have some performances and stuff going on too. Um like just last night we had a a thing called Synth Timber, which was like um kind of a demonstration of modular synthesis and kind of the core of how it works and stuff uh, with this fellow Aaron Gum who lives in Omaha. Uh that was really fun. That's so um, sick. Yeah. Oh yeah, it was super fun. So yeah, we we have a few things going on. Um gosh, a few of the cool local things. Um are you guys familiar with uh, Jay Kramer's work at all? Uh, Stats, he's not one of the Timbal Tape artists, is he? You know, I guess he is now. He, um, <laughs> yeah. So the, well, in fact, that might be an interesting way to talk about Timbal Tape. So oh. I had, um, because I, I know, I know you all were interested in, um, Timbal kind of disappeared for a little bit and is kind of back now, um, and that's basically because of Jay. <laughs> so oh. that is, it is oh, a good sick. segue into that. Um, yeah, I had, um. I, I had some sort of weird um, medical issues in late 2019 and just kind of uh, ended up needing to sort of juggle like how much stuff I could do at, the, uh-huh. at one time, basically. And so um, in kind of thinking about the things I was um, participating in at the time, I was like, you know, I think maybe I'll just let uh, Timble kind of rest for a while. Uh-huh. Um, so I did. But then uh, Jay had this really cool project. Um, it's that Splunkers tape. Um, wow. I'll hold one up here, too. So um, thank yeah, you. The cover. I'm not sure where I'm at. There I am. There we <laughs> go. <laughs> that little thing. Yeah. So uh, the Smokers tape is basically him and Bill Brovald. Um, it's kind of like a deep listening sounding thing. Um, in fact, he um, Jay is part of the deep listening Paulino Veros Institute thing. Oh, sick. Um, and so this was recorded in some caves in upstate New York. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I it's, keep my tape on the bedside. <laughs> beautiful. Yeah, I I love that recording. It's well, and really all the deep listening man stuff is so beautiful. Um, and this is kind of an extension of that kind of philosophy. Um, the the recording is primarily uh, Bill Rowald and Jay, uh, but they also have. Let me look here. Um, Rob Bethia is playing euphonium, and then Fred Lundberg Home is playing cello on it as well. Oh, Fred Lundberg Home's on there. Yeah, it's oh, it's an, that's sick. It's I an amazing recording. His 2021 per notice is really good, and I've always had that in my want list, and just never been like, I'm gonna drop 12 bucks today on it, but I should. Right, right. right. Yeah, and it was just one of those things where you know Jay's done quite a few recordings over the years. Um, his main project in Lincoln is this thing called Mighty Vitamins that's been kind of an ongoing concern for gosh, probably 20 years or so now. Ooh. And um, there's one Mighty Vitamins album I think on Public Eye Store Records um, that you can find. Uh. Um, but mostly they just do a lot of performances in the Lincoln area. Um, they're kind of like one of the you know long term, well, kind of role model projects, I guess you could say for the area. Yeah. And um, so he had this recording and nobody was picking it up. He shot it to some labels. Nobody was doing anything. And the two of us had started doing a project together, um, kind of a duo thing, although sometimes we've had some other people sit in um, called the Irregular Verbs. Um, I think we're going to do a tape with that next year, too. But um, as we were playing with that, he was like, you know, I have this really cool recording and nobody wants to do anything with it. I wonder if Timbal would be a good thing. I was like, well, it would be, wouldn't it? And so, um, yeah, so I started it up again, basically 
initially just to get that tape out there because then he did some performances with that. Uh-huh. Um, I guess in in the New York area, I want to say it was in the spring of this year. And then um, Jay has done a couple of Fulbrights. He's he's been going to India and teaching people how to make instruments. He he's basically oh, an so instrument um, designer, and so he makes all of his own really um, cool wild instruments. Um, in fact, he has um during this last Fulbright where he was there a good chunk of last year, um, a, a filmmaker made a movie about him that's about to hit the film festival circuit. I think it's going to be called That's Just It. Uh-huh. Um, there's a trailer for it on Vimeo now, okay. um, which is just so cool because like you can kind of see like. Um, Jay's process, you know, he's just such an interesting person where he, he just uh, kind of looks at, um, everyday objects and sees sounds inside them, you know, mm-hmm. and starts putting things together. So in India, he's kind of, you know, just wandering around on these kind of street flea market areas and, you know, finding cool stuff and then bringing it back to his, the, the studio that he's working in there and piecing things together and kind of showing other people how that works and, um, making really interesting music out of it. So that's been really fun. Um, and then in the Omaha area, we've had some good stuff going on. Um, there's, uh, let's see, there's been a, a noise brunch series that's been going on there for, oh, that's sick. I think it's coming up on two years now, which that's been, yeah, really cool to have that mm-hmm. happening. That's awesome. Um, in fact, a couple months ago they had, um, their first like noise fest thing. Mm-hmm. And I have just, I, I was just so touched by the whole thing. I, I left work a little early that day to, to go check it out. And it was just like, they, they figured out, they got some funding to make it free, um, to, to have everyone paid but still have the audience come in for free. Uh-huh. Um, and so in some ways I'm thinking Omaha maybe is a little bit more the center of adventurous music in Nebraska right now compared to Lincoln. Um, the crew that's doing the noise brunches, that's kind of a monthly thing. Um, gosh, they just had, well, like with this, uh, this place project project, there was kind of the center area that they used for this, this noise festival thing. And there were like literally hundreds of people there. And they had like four stages going simultaneously. Oh, wow. An outdoor stage inside Project Project, like a trailer thing, and then like a thing inside a garage. And all this incredible music happening. It was just really touching. I mean, there was many people running around for like a noise fest, as you would expect to see at like a, you know, a pop music festival or yeah. something. Mm-hmm. It was really touching. That's wild to hear. Yeah. It's out in, out in San Diego, there's a couple of little, there's small different little collectives and kind of things doing their own stuff. But there's one collective mm-hmm. called Stay Strange. And they've hosted a modular synthesizer guy, Matthew Riles, at one of the branches. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, he does his modular synth stuff. And they've done some modular synth shows in t- on top of a noise festival as well at the Central Branch in San Diego. Or like oh, try wow. to carry a bit of a festival. And it's the only time i've really ever seen i've done just a tad bit of research into that but like actual noise getting platformed by a library and it really really, super cool i thought that was incredible and then just hearing about this which i don't think is attached to a library but that's just so unique yeah this one technically wasn't attached to a library but um yeah i guess i haven't done anything purely uh, like with the poly music library um i have done some things that i guess you could say are sort of noise adjacent Mm -hmm. um Gosh, let me see what I've had this year or something. I've, I took some notes down just to remember what I've done because it's been a pretty busy year. Um, gosh, we had, um, so, well, as far as the music library goes, I started there in 2019, um, but the library itself um, was established um, 41 years ago this year. Oh, wow. That's um, sick. So it's a really special place. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of unusual for a public library. Um, we have a lot of the same material you'd expect to find in like an academic music library in terms yeah. of like... Mm-hmm. Um, music history resources and study scores and chamber music scores and parts and stuff. Yeah. Um, but lots of like music histories and biographies for all kinds of music genres too. Um, sheet music for all kinds of instruments, books on learning to play pretty much any kind of instrument you can think of. Um, lots of DIY books just for learning how to, you know, do your own recording and mixing and mastering. Oh, awesome. And, yeah. Um, thinking about the business side of making music, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and like new areas too, like um, video game music has become a really big area. Oh wow! Um, yeah. Which has developed its own academic name now. It's called Ludo Musicology. Really? What's that, that is what's insane. What's the decimal on that? I'm curious because I haven't seen a particular like Dewey decimal attach that or a section where that music's going. That's not. Oh just yeah. Like six. Um, you know, I'd have to look it up too. It's seven, seven eighty one something. It's Whoa. it's low in the it's low in the seven eighties. Whoa! So, I'm in the seven eighties all day long, so it's uh. Yeah, <laughs> the whole area gets pretty, pretty intense. But um, yeah, we, you know, we try to have you know a little bit of everything. Well, like to name a couple of recent shows, I guess. Um, 
Uh, in August, we had Toby Driver uh, from KO Dot stop by. Oh wow, um, that's wow. sick! That was that was pretty that's fun. Insane, actually. Yeah, that was an interesting project. We, now we didn't do KO Dot stuff in the library. Um, he's he's touring. Well, he was going out basically to the West Coast to do a couple shows with KO Dot, mm-hmm. and then heading basically. Well, his tour uh, routing ended up being kind of funny. I think he was in like it was like Portland, Oregon, Lincoln, uh-huh. Nebraska, Portland, Maine. <laughs> very very long That's, drives yeah. between those crazy um but yeah so we had him do two things here um uh, at the library he did some of his laura crucible music it's kind of that more new age influence stuff and he's been playing hammered dulcimer which is really interesting oh, wow. so that was the the cool thing for the library is to have like um he he both performed and then kind of explained how he's incorporating hammered dulcimer into you know what's sort of like a, a combination of progressive rock and new age music essentially um, so that was really fascinating. You know, we always get like great questions from people who come to see these things. Like the audiences are um, maybe my favorite thing about all these performances, really, because they ask, you know, fascinating questions, things I haven't thought about at all. I'm just like, wow, that's a great question. You know, so that that's always really fun. Um, and then we had uh, Jeremy Young was back a couple months ago. He he was playing basically at the very end of his very long tour doing that August tape sketches piece that came out on cassette last uh, September, I think. So it's been about a year, I think. Um, he's uh, Jeremy's in that uh, ensemble Sondhog Shogun uh, that performs a lot cool. too, and he's I think he's run his own label and press and stuff too. He's a polyaver press and so forth. But um, the tape sketches thing was I guess you could say that's sort of noise adjacent too. That that piece is all based on tape loops, um, and he he performed the whole thing with. Um, it's really interesting getting to see the physicality of that because he was using like um, mic stands, kind of like this mic stand I'm using here. Um, he had it set very horizontally so we could like hang all the loops uh-huh. on it and then was like switching things back and forth and manipulating things on a couple different oh, machines. Sick. Um, so that was kind of fun to see. He had a really great time too. And um, we let that get pretty loud for the library too. I think that was the loudest performance we've done. <laughs> um, I, I was like, go ahead and crank it up. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, we had fun. Like um, we do them right in the middle of the library too. So like the, the music library is on the second floor of the the main branch, uh, downtown library in Lincoln. Mm-hmm. Um the other stuff on that floor is basically like the computer lab is in one wing yeah. and then the music library is in one wing and then biography is basically. And so I kind of go over to a section of the biographies area and we just kind of clear things out and do stuff over there. Uh-huh. So most performances are like right in the middle of things. So people, you know, are walking by and maybe we'll stop and, you know, sit down and check stuff out. So is this, do these happen kind of, like kind of, midday type deal or? Yeah, they're usually midday, like, um, usually weekends in the kind of one to two or two to 3 PM kind of range, Mm -hmm. um, which can be helpful too, for like, we have a lot of local performances and stuff too, of course, but with situations like Jeremy Young or or Toby driver, where they're touring and looking for like evening gigs, um, it can be a good thing where, you know, they can come to the library and do something where it's um, partially a performance, but also partially just kind of like a lecture or QA kind of thing. Uh And then they can still like take an evening gig. So like in this case, um, Toby had a gig at uh, Duffy's here in town, um, a club that night. So, um, that way he was able to do like kind of a fuller performance and then also um, do something in the afternoon. So that makes it worth sick. stopping in Lincoln. Right. So <laughs> that's brilliant. That is like so sick. I wish we had something like that out here We're gonna have to make our own little library now. I know that is so yeah. cool. That is insane. Uh, so it, do you guys, a lot of fun. do you guys like archive, like the, the live performances or the lectures or anything and like store the audio, like in mm. the library? You know, we don't, um, I, th- I wish we did, but yeah, at this point, everything's been kind of low to tech. Uh-huh. Um, I was doing, you know, during the pandemic, um, I did do a few things that were more like live streamy kinds of things, but yeah, um, I've kind of, you know, since we've kind of gotten past that point, although I guess, you know, COVID's kind of back again too, I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I've been trying to kind of, I guess, force people locally just to like get in and participate as much as possible to kind of get back to, um, you know, because I, I think one of the things I think that's important about libraries is that they can be a place for people to be together, like in a in a literal sense. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, although you know, I do want to be sensitive too, to to folks that are having issues where they can't get into the library for whatever reason too. So we we definitely have um like we have resources where I can have stuff mailed to people and things like that too locally. So Sick. there's a little bit of both. I do a lot of um, talking to people both um, on the phone and um, taking questions through email and internet or whatever too, and um, you know whatever um circumstance a person has that they you know need us to provide we try to to meet them where they are and and do that but yeah for for things in the library like um like as an example i've been trying to do this uh, songwriting composing club thing um for about a year and a half now um it's kind of sort of taking off it just depends i guess it's um 
you know, it's scheduling stuff, I guess. So yeah. it's a, a monthly thing. Um, it usually meets like six to seven. So I, that way I was hoping, you know, folks who were getting off work at five could, you know, kind of come down to it. Uh -huh. Um, and you know, some, I think some months we get like six people, seven people, eight people. Um, some months we get, um, two, one, zero. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's just, it's hard to say. So I, I'm kind of hoping that will get some legs. Cause what I'm hoping that will grow into is kind of a mutual support thing, I guess, where, you know, people will, they can bring in pieces that they're working on that they're maybe having a question about some area or that they are looking for a particular kind of collaborator to work with and, you know, meet other people. And, and, you know, the people there could end up being sort of like the, the real resource there. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So I try to like get people to, you know, bring in, you know, whatever they're working on, whatever level, it doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't have to be sheet music stuff. I mean, a lot of people are bringing in like their laptops with recordings they're working on stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of singer songwriters come in with a guitar and just like play and sing what they're working on. Um, it's a cool. pretty interesting variety. We've had some, some folks come in that, you know, some surprising projects. I mean, there, there are some folks locally who have worked on like, um, Broadway style musicals, like full productions wow. and stuff. Um, that's crazy. Yeah, I had no idea. Like people, it surprises you the stuff that people are doing that, you know, they just don't talk to anybody else about, and then they show up at a thing like this and they're like this fully developed, very, yeah. um, interesting, complex musical background. You're like, well, where are you from? That's just so cool. You know, yeah. it's really interesting. So, um, well, actually, oh no, Thomas, you got, you got, oh, I was just yeah. going to ask, do you feel like the music library is getting used as much as like the normal library and stuff? Like, do you feel like people are like engaging with like everything, like a lot? Um, just I like, think so. I mean, it could certainly still use more engagement. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of those things where, um, well, before I started at the music library, um, I worked at the talking book and braille service for the state of Nebraska for, I guess about 15 years altogether. Okay, cool. And the, one of the things over there that we were constantly doing was outreach. Like it was like, you know, the, the constant mode of mm -hmm. like just letting people know you exist when they, yeah, because you know, yeah. they, they don't necessarily know you exist until they need you. Um, and so this is one of those situations that's kind of similar where, um, I feel like one of my big roles is constantly being in an outreach mode, just letting people know, like, um, what, especially young folks, just like trying to talk to high school kids, especially. And, um, like for instance, the, we have a, a huge section of like, uh, piano vocal arrangements of musicals yeah. and that stuff's super popular with, with a certain clique of high school kids that know about it, but just letting yeah. folks know that, yeah. that it's there, um, becomes kind of a big deal. So. So what are your, what are some of your like main, uh, forms of like outreach? Like, what are you doing to like, let people know that this like library is like a, an active like resource? Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Going out and doing community events and talking to people, yeah. um, different like, um, summertime events, so having a booth, stuff like that. And yeah, talking yeah. to people, mm -hmm. um, before COVID I was able to go directly into the high schools, but they've been a little bit more limiting as far as like having people visit lately. See, so yeah. that's been a little trickier. Mm -hmm. Um, radio actually has been, Oh, sick. Um, yeah. One of the best ways I, I, the I mixes. Do, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's been a big deal. So I do like a half hour radio program each, each week. Um, kind of talking about different things from the collection. Um, usually I do sort of like a book talk at the beginning and then play music kind of related to the book. Um, so it's a half hour thing. I pre-record it and then they air it twice on uh, KZUM radio here in Lincoln. Uh -huh. Um, so and it gets cool. archived on Mixcloud too. So anybody anywhere can listen to them on Mixcloud. So, um, and in fact, it's on PRX too. So, um, Oh dude, that's sick. Have, yeah. If y'all have stations that, um, can, you know, take stuff from PRX. Dude, Maddie, we have PRX. For, we should radio. tell, we should tell KCSB to air that. That's yeah. sick. I think that would yeah. actually be a lovely. Dude, it's, it's Scott, I'm going to tell them, I'm going to tell them. Yeah. You need you need to let him know though about this because this is if this would really fit with KCSB and I I skimmed sure. a couple episodes and I'm like, oh, this is this is perfect. This is really intense. Just like taking a book on a topic, presenting it to an audience and playing a few selections. And that can be that's a dedicated thing to to get people because into like that section of the library and consider it. It took me years to realize how really rigidly developed music um kind of the music sections of libraries can be like going downtown to San Diego public and seeing that's a very dedicated seven, you know, 80 section that's covering right. a lot of different stuff from again, the classic sheet music to German yeah. electronic composers to hip hop photography mm -hmm. to again, just right. all of the CDs itself. And it, it kind of boggles my mind. There was a couple of questions I guess I had off of that. Cause earlier you were talking about, um, just talking over the phone or kind of trying to talk to people about it, you know, just meeting them where they are, whether it's right. email or phone. So 
are you doing a lot of reference kind of work for them? And is that reference work, especially coming from outside of the community there? Do people want to do ILLs at the library? Oh uh, yeah. Good question. Um, most of it is local. Um, I do get, well, it's funny from the radio show, a lot of the calls that I get that aren't local are actually from authors who somehow hear about the radio show. Oh, wow. <laughs> so there's that. Um, yeah, they hear about the book. Well, a lot of it. So I, with the content for those, I'll, I'll generally take the, I'll write up a little script about the book. That's kind of like a book review. Um, I'll do the show and then I'll kind of mess with the writing that I did for the, the radio script and turn it into like a, a more formal book review. And then those go on the Lincoln city Library's staff recommendations page on our website. And I think that's where the authors are finding it because they're Googling their names and it pops uh -huh. up. Um, so yeah, I'll get calls from a few different authors. I've done some, you know, those books have been I'm trying to think of a few authors that have contacted me. Um, like, uh, I can't think of the fellow's name right offhand, but a pretty recent book on weather report. Um, oh, that, that fellow was really interested in that. That's cool. Um, Unikai contacted me a while back. Um, he had this, um, crazy book on David Tudor. Um, oh, cool. it is the most intense book. That that is a a serious serious book. Um, it's massive. Uh, David Tudor was such an elusive personality. Uh -huh. uh, the pianist that mostly worked with John Cage, I guess, is how most yeah. folks know him. Yeah. But um, his own music was just oh gosh, it's so so deep. There's so much to learn there, and he was sort of an elusive person. Um, not I guess you wouldn't call him super friendly. His little prickly in interviews and things like that. If he even did them, he very infrequently did them. But um, Nakai went kind of around the country looking for a few different places where there are repositories of his materials and put all this stuff together and kind of reverse engineered his, I guess, as close as you could get to his life. I mean, it's it is more focused on his work, but I think he was one of those folks who whose work was his life. Like he didn't really have a lot of, uh, you know, other social concerns. He was very, very focused mm -hmm. on what he was doing. And, um, he, you know, he was building his own, like he's the talking about like noise music and tapes and stuff. Like he's kind of the inventor of like the no input, um, mixer kind of thing. Like he was doing stuff like that, um, in, in the early sixties. Oh, wow. Crazy. That's sick. Yeah. I mean, just figuring out how to do it and drawing up his own like circuit diagrams mm -hmm. to start making his own equipment to kind of put into a no input mixer system oh, to kind wow. of start modifying it. Um, very interesting stuff, sort of like pre modular synthesizer synthesis in a way. Um, wow. Very cool. In in regards, I guess I'm a little curious there because you were talking about the music books. Any particular music books recently in this year, or kind of just lifelong that you really resonated with that's really come back for you? Oh yeah, from well for me, um, and I try not to like in the library. I definitely try to answer people's questions with what they need as opposed to uh, my my own interest. I guess because I. Certainly, I do have eclectic interests as well. Um, <laughs> I listen to normal music too, <laughs> but um, I do. I think there's no more episode. That just sounds like a great yeah. time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I definitely try to show. Like uh, for this month, I'm working on. Um, there's a, a new book about uh, the Bach cello suites, so I'll probably do a thing on that. Um, and then a couple new books on black metal, so I'll probably do a thing on that. So yeah, oh, a little sick. bit of everything. That's cool. Um, but this year, I, well, okay, for me, generally, um, the Arcana series that John Zorn edited over about a almost a 20 year period um there's 10 volumes of that those books were super super important to me um they came out just after i'd gotten out of music school i was in music school like 96 to 2000 i think the first one of those came out in 2000 or 2001 we get into um, that soon <laughs> oh yeah yeah um and those were yeah it was just such a, a powerful thing to be able to read like primary source documents from some of the folks on the downtown scene um just getting to sort of know what they're up to and um yeah, there are folks that don't get interviewed so much. So it's an interesting series of books because you kind of get to to hear from folks that, you know, haven't gotten that much attention from the music press, but are doing really important work, I think. Um, for this year, um, gosh, my favorites this year are probably, let me look up the exact name of this book. There's a, we'll check this here. Um, yeah, Cisco Bradley has this new book called The Williamsburg Avant-Garde. Um, experimental music and sound on the Brooklyn waterfront, which is basically about the the art scene in Brooklyn and and uh, oh, that's cool. Bands oh, like wow. uh, Little Women is on the cover of the book. Oh, I sick. mean, um, there's lots of Sweet Z's and uh, Mike. Every band Mike Pride has played with, which is apparently about 500 according to the book. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, fantastic, amazing. Like just so many cool things in there. So a lot of stuff that's um jazz or postmodern, classical, or you know that kind of industry it was hard to describe that scene wasn't it i mean it's really hard to put a genre tag on what a lot of those folks were doing They're, especially because whenever i think of that it's like i don't have a big familiarity but 
when I'm thinking of kind of 2000s Brooklyn experimental, there's a bit of the sonic youth jamming that's going on. You have boredoms really entering into America right. and doing the drum pieces, which culminates then in the giant drum celebration yeah. in 2009. And then yeah. Black Dice. Black yeah. Dice kind of linking those worlds between ANCO and DFA. And right. with Beaches and Canyons making like something that still... I think really resonates or can get people into that kind of music without ever knowing those worlds. Right. Absolutely. So that one, I, I think I, I really loved that whole scene. That was kind of like when I first got out of school, that was the stuff where I was like, Oh, these are my people, you know, like I wasn't in New York, but I was just everything I heard from that scene. I was just like, this is, this is what I want to do. I love all this music. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so that, that book I think was really touching to me just because it kind of, mentions a lot of bands that I have never seen anybody talk about before. It was just really cool to see them interviewed and, you know, taken seriously, basically. And then the other one, um, I'll just hold up here as well, is uh, Mark Masters' new oh. book. Oh, Mark. sick. I'm getting a yeah. chance to talk to Mark with the tabs out, guys, soon. Dude, and that's I, dope, Maddie. I have not heard how the book is, and I was sent no early coverage or anything of it. So oh, I'm man. just there to kind of sit, pick, and then ask him about his uh, favorites of 1990 to see if he still thinks <laughs> real trucks and that one matador comp he likes holds up. I think, <laughs> I don't think the matador comp holds up, but I love twin infinitive. So Mark, I'm coming for you. Awesome. Yeah. This Dude. book is so good. He did just such a great job. Um, and I'm not saying that because he quotes me a couple of times in it. <laughs> so <laughs> he did such a good job on Well, honestly, so he did the book and the, the book he was is out like think, five years ago. He, cause I remember yeah. I just started getting into cassettes right as he stopped doing the best cassette column and's like hey it's right. gonna be best experimental but don't worry i'm writing a book on the history of cassettes so right yeah yeah and i think this got delayed a little bit with covid too although it's one of those situations where i think maybe he also had a little more time to work on it yeah um so it maybe got even more a little maybe more developed than it would have been too so it it really covers a lot of ground i mean he he goes into you know, like the significance of the cassette media to the development of hip hop, for example, um, oh, sick. and how important cassettes still are internationally. Like there are other countries, like in India, they're still like a really important. Situation. Oh, really? Oh, wow. So it's, it's funny to see all this stuff. Cause it's like, I've got, I mean, I've got a handful of my hip hop tapes and I try to get the stuff on that format when applicable. And then right. I've seen the India stuff come up and I've bought in tapes from Indonesia and that format through like 2006 or seven, you can still find some very weird titles that mm -hmm. because it's like, this is an indie album that had major label support. So it right. got a cassette release. It's like, clap your hands, say, yeah, the rapture, um, source yeah, tags, yeah. codes by trail of the dead. I found Indonesian cassettes of these and I'm like, Oh, it's great. This is the way I want to listen. It rules. But yeah. I'm curious, does he have anything on eBay tape lots in there? Because I know over 2022, Ooh. he was posting photos of eBay tape lots, and I knew what they were. I'm like, I'm watching this on eBay, Mark. Like, I knew. <laughs> and um, it was always really, because he posted with that, you can only choose one. He was really interested I remember in that. collections. Yeah, and I'm I, trying to kind of figure. And I when I go to cassette culture daily, and I look at what people are posting to kind of like half roll my eyes, can't figure out if there's a tape that exists of something I didn't know because a lot right. of people love a lot of the same music that it's not my thing, but I really respect just seeing like there's a shared history and idea in kind of American pop culture of what the cassette is that mm -hmm. can be subverted really easily by any of the stuff he's got in there. I imagine. Yeah. You know, I don't, I'm just taking a quick thumb through here to look at the photos too. I, I don't think he did specifically mention the, the, like giant ebay lots and stuff um although he did he has i guess most of the photos in here gravitate toward um like the very occasional cassette kiosks and stores you can yeah. find mostly in other countries mm -hmm. um he did as far as like the focus on underground music and stuff too he he does have quite an extensive set of interviews from people from kind of like the first round of cassette culture like the 80s folks oh, sick. um i'd say the the preponderance of the earlier sections of the book he has a lot of stuff on them and then the very last chapter um, which what's it called here? Tapes not dead. Um, is kind of talking to some of the newer cassette label folks. Um, he talked to me and oh, dude, well, he, awesome. so he did this cassette comp too. So like, there's this. Um, oh, that's right. In the way. Um, this thing has. Well, I'm just name, naming some of the labels on here. Um, these are basically the folks he talked to in the book. So you've got like uh, already dead, astral spirits, constellation, Crazy. Tatsu, crash yeah. symbols, eider down, Fort evil fruit, geographic north. 
Halcyon Mountain, Moon Glyph, Null Zone, Orange Milk, and Zimbal. So, yeah. dude, that's insane. Wow. I didn't know he, he got yeah. Moon Glyph on there funny. too. Damn, that's sick. There, yeah. there's about I've got titles from ten to eleven of those labels. I think yeah. the one that starts with F. I don't know. And again, the Geographic North guys have always been proponents. Right. They, I interviewed those guys in 2020 just to see what was up because. I don't know if they're going to do another big comp, but I was super, super thrilled with what they had accomplished for that comp. Right. And right. then we talked, we talked to Mr. Moonglyph. Uh-huh. I've, yeah. I've chatted with Steve over email from Constellation Todd Sue. And we got to see if Steve wants to be on the show at some point too. Yeah. We'll get Steve on for a quickie, but it's good to see. It's a really yeah. healthy little vital scene. And I know what he's carrying and why he would yeah. go with those. Cause he's been watching those guys for the last decade. Right. Everybody there. And, to yeah. me, all of those labels are really at the proponent of like, this is why there's a really healthy cassette ecosystem right mm-hmm. now. And- I think so too. Yeah, it's a good balance of labels, I think. he. Um, well, it, and it's funny, it reflects, I guess, some of my taste and interest in that stuff too. I, I wish I could, I'm on like an iMac thing here, so I can't move it very easily, but like almost everything on Constellation Tatsu is just to the right of me here. Oh, that's and, sick. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, there's, and then almost everything on Already Dead is, um, well, almost is relative, I guess, because I think almost already dead has like 400 something tapes now which is pretty intense um there's maybe 300 of them there or so but um yeah it's it's um eider down is one of those labels that i've always just like the curation is so so good and and it's kind of a specific sound but it's so good um orange milk of course is like you know classic music of the future basically all the time (laughs) so um yeah that's been i mean i really look to them and you know some of the stuff on like housey mountain who we also talked to is like kind of kind of knowing anticipating what's coming next in music in general mm-hmm. yeah um those things sure. which i think is the, an area that cassettes are still really important for too you know a discussion um that's happening through actual sound instead of yeah. people just kind of talking willy-nilly about what they think might come next like people mm-hmm. are just doing it and putting it on those labels so. yeah definitely that's what's been really interesting is that like i don't always have the money to put up stuff or i decide hey i gotta drop money i need to spend mm-hmm. you know Ton of money to get the DJ Shadow tape or something. So sorry, can't support the scene today. But like, right. I get stuff from Mike from Tabs Out, and I can see like new labels like Jollies, which I think are really, really yeah. solid, you know? or Drongo tapes, which mm-hmm. um, Elliot over the past several years up in Seattle, what they've been able to do, they they created a kind of a whole network. Um, the yeah. Coral Canyon, the guy down there in Texas. Yeah, so all of these, and then on top of it, it's like. Astral Spirits, which is kind of pivoted more into being a legit vinyl jazz label, but with Astral Editions has been able to like still kind of say that. And with the tapes that come through, it's some of the best material. And there still yep. is like real robust dialogue that even if they're not quite always there with, it's like um, Triptych's tapes has picked up on a lot of the free jazz stuff. I Triptych's, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. And then yeah. also, like, I've been talking with some buddies online and this this new sound or this new thing, this ambient Americana, which as soon as you talk to a few people, you realize, OK, it's been going on for like 40, 50 odd years. But right. there is, especially right now, in a lot of cassette labels or just kind of cassettes we see, mm-hmm. these releases that are popping up that are right. really resonating and responding right here, right now. And it's just like a documentation of a moment. And when you... Yep. When you have the tapes, when you access all of this, you you do get to see that dialogue happening with sound. That's that's just there. It's been right. curated. Somebody else heard it. Somebody else is putting it out. But if you can piece together, if you have the money, the time, the wherewithal, the knowledge, th- there's something very unique there that is happening with all those underground tape sounds. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I kind of think like cassettes and radio are kind of the the areas left where. Um, people that are kind of like really digging and trying to find like what's happening next or just like, you know, finding these cool sounds and putting them out there for people. Mm-hmm. And um, it's just one of those things that, and it's a community too. I mean, you get to know, like of all the labels we mentioned, like almost everybody has have played multiple roles in the scene too. You know, like they, yeah. they've, they've done, they've been radio DJs, they've for run sure. a, a mm-hmm. cassette label, they've been musicians and performers themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, they've written about music. Um, we, we all kind of have to do a little bit of all of it, you know, mm-hmm. just to, to keep everything running and, you know, kind of maybe switch roles from time to time and do different things and, mm-hmm. um, just kind of keeps, keeps the train moving and everybody gets a chance to, you know, help support one another that way too. So I think the, the mutual support aspect of the whole scene, I think is probably my favorite thing about it these days, honestly. I mean, 
it's a, a pretty mean world these days sometimes, you know, and it's really incredible to find ways that you can, you know, feel like this real friendship with people that you maybe haven't even met in person, you know, um, like you guys too, you know, I mean, it's, it's just like, I know you're, I know you're my people, you know, it's like just one of those things. Every, yeah. Like we've all been there and we know what's going on and, and the work has to be done and, um, and it's not even work. It's, it's a joy to do. So, yeah. I think, you yeah, know, I was reading, I recently read the K records book. I just returned that. And that's, I don't know if any Calvin Harris or K stuff comes up to talk about his thoughts on cassette there in the eighties. But what I found really inspiring or moving in there, just talking to a couple people in the Olympia scene in that book is how they're like, everybody was being pushed to contribute in, in whatever way really that kind of suited them or could work for them. <laughs> and right. Tom and I are not musicians. This is kind of our way of doing that or like, the review I can write or just networking and kind of platforming something. And yes, we have kind of lamented and tiptoed over different shows we've done. Like the, there is at this point, no central tiny mixtapes. There's a lot of individual players and spread out stuff and dialogues that are happening in kind of not the tiny mixtapes back room forums, but discord servers or DMS or other stuff. Right. But it still is lingering, still echoing. And there's still a push for kind of new futures and new frontiers. Yeah, you're right. I, I do kind of miss like the review blog thing in general was, I think, really important. And Tiny Mixtape was sort of the the epicenter of, of that scene, you know, working, a, uh, you know, a little differently than, say, something like Pitchfork that seems mm-hmm. like more of a tastemaker than a, a yeah, area of sure. mm-hmm. discussion and, and nuance. Um, and, yeah, we're kind of lacking that at this specific moment. Um I mean, some of the stuff you guys are writing for tabs out too is still getting some of that discussion out there too, though. So, mm-hmm. but yeah, the writers, uh, you know, the writing thing is funny because I think we all end up kind of burning out after a while. No, we, um, we do. And I'm gosh. definitely ebbed and flowed through that, especially mm-hmm. this year, but just knowing yeah. I don't, because it's like, there's so much great music coming out, but there is also, I think, a necessity. And it's like, I'm not a Ryan Mastell in that I could just write something that really, I think, was kind of beautiful in that way, or just it mm-hmm. worked beyond a PR as just somebody just engaging with music in such a strange way to do kind of the chocolate grinder. Yeah. And it's like when a tape resonates, though, you really want to sit down and give it that time. Right. And it is a little frustrating that, you know, I don't always have the infinite time needed to to write four to five paragraphs that I think get it something more than just a little bit of regurgitation or a little bit pulling from PR, something that feels like. Yeah. That's a discussion about an album and a sound or what I'm feeling right now. It's hard to document that stuff, mm-hmm. but there are still a network of blogs. I feel there's still stuff coming through. Yeah. Yeah. There's still some stuff coming through. You know, I'm hoping we'll see, I, I think all these things sort of wax and wane. And so we'll probably see more writing happening again too, because I think people will get sick of, of some of the, the shorter and less nuanced kinds of discussion that are happening. Um, even say like like Discord servers and stuff too. You know, I've I've chatted with a few folks on those, you know, some of those resources too. And it's cool, but they they tend not to stay focused on the the music. You know, I mean, they it's very easy to go off the rails and talk about all kinds of stuff on those, which is cool yeah. too, because then you're again developing you know friendships with those folks, mm-hmm. which is cool. Um, but as far as like trying to like like you said, platform the music and try to get new things out there and get discussions sort of generating and starting around those things. They're maybe not as useful for that. It ends up just being very clicky. And so I think people will, I think it goes back and forth, you know, like right now people are enjoying the the notion that they can have these small groups, but at some point they'll want some broader discussion again too. And re- in realistic um, terms, experimental music as a whole is a pretty small scene anyway. So we don't want to splinter it any more than we have to, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, we'll definitely want to have, you know, some of those broader discussions, but yeah, tiny mixtapes is kind of a, a loss i mean that's i'm definitely still missing that too i only ever wrote one thing for them um i got really excited i think back then i was i was writing mostly for smaller things back back in that time period like mm-hmm. uh, killed in cars and um well some tabs out stuff too and then i had my own blog called words awesome. on sounds um i had the, there was this uh disney silly symphonies box set thing that came out like oh gosh that must have been six or seven years ago now um and i was so excited about that that i i like contacted tiny mixtapes i was like i need to write about this for you guys because it needs to exactly like we were talking about like i want more people to Mm -hmm. to hear about this and talk about it because i think it's like super significant you know i mean like in terms of all kinds of music all but pretty much all film music a lot of experimental music um 
all kinds of TV, uh, radio plays, uh, all kinds of things that came after these, which started in like 1929, mm-hmm. are all all go back to what happened in these silly symphonies that were like from 1929 to 33 or so. Oh, and interesting. And it was like the first time they've ever all been like, all the music from all of them has been put together in a way that you could sit and listen to them all. And so I was just like, this is like groundbreaking. It's you know still to this day, one of the most important recordings that's been put out, I think in the last, oh, 25 years or so, I think. So um, it was great to have a way to, to get that out there. So, but yeah, now I don't know where you would take that. I mean, like what's, what's Pitchfork going to do with that? <laughs> I mean, the, yeah. you know, the best you'll get is like a Saturday best new music with a or best new reissue with an 8.6 or something like it's right even now i kind of feel like pitchfork can be very dire because you're not even getting four reviews a day five days a week you're getting maybe three right there are a great i do actually think at this point shockingly the site has probably the best contributor network they've had in like a decade since that's true yeah at this point with the with sam goldner there with nadine smith with a handful of other people. I don't think everybody always does their best, but the beats that a few people are really attuned to, it's like they they can just be an authority. But that's also the problem is that it's like they're not on tiny mixtapes, kind of with other writers trading back and forth. It's this is Sam Goldner's take on, you mm-hmm. know, the random hyperpop, the random experimental thing. Mm-hmm. And it can almost seem a little bit more authoritative than something else, even if Sam's voice, I think, just kills it he knocks it out it's always very personable and funny so definitely i i wish they would cover more random stuff like that or like um mark masters would get the outdoor back with with grayson i don't think that's ever going to happen but yep yeah and like the you know the wire is doing some good stuff but again the wire ends up being kind of I mean, you have to subscribe to it. It's it's hard to access a lot of that information. And so it it seems clicky in that sense too. That's part of it because I've if it wasn't for Christmas subscriptions as presents, I wouldn't have the wire. And I'm looking over at my little collection of about 20 plus back issues. Like right. our station KCSB got listed as one of their like top stations um for yeah, online crazy. radio back in yeah. 2021. No one. No one was reaching out to tell that to KCSB. And the only reason I knew was because I had bought it in oh my gosh. Chicago. And I was like, <laughs> it, 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 it's then hard even to tell when you're a remote programmer, tell other people at the station, like, this is really huge and big. And it means we're doing something and that we should be, we're serious. Like we're next to KCRW or um, KEXP or other stuff mm-hmm. kind of. Like like yeah. Dub Lab or NTS, like the way that those get treated, it's like no, your your little college radio station is doing that too. Mm-hmm. So, and then even still, when I read through, I'm skimming major stuff at this point. I'm skimming just to see if something came out on cassette. Most the reviews are written to a very particular recipe formula, and yeah. some people are really good at that. I think some people, I'm just like, okay, you're getting your dough, rock on. But if it, <laughs> I, it's not going to always be my thing because that's very rigid stuff there's not like it's not like mark fisher is going to come through and you know blow your mind but sometimes when they let a critic go off there really get into something situated a great review shines out or a great interview piece yeah. the covers as well it's killer for that alone mm-hmm. yeah those covers are really great yeah yeah they've been doing some good coverage lately but yeah same thing i mean i don't have a subscription so i, I mostly hear secondhand about like what cool stuff is happening mm-hmm. like arvo will tell me or something like that mm-hmm. so um, oh, yeah, like, I saw the no part of it. Lady. No part of it bought an ad, and that's that's the other thing. The yeah. only place where you can see legitimate news ads, music ads that yeah. it reminds me of being like in elementary school or middle school, getting Game Informer or the Xbox magazine, and right. just being like, "Oh, that's targeted to me." And it's like how I learned, "Oh, mm-hmm. Warp did reissue the Black Dog." Like, great. Yeah. Did not know otherwise. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was glad he did that too. He that was funny because he um he had contacted me after he placed that ad too, because this, so he just did this new thing that um, I guess the official release date is October 1st for the, my first solo album thing. And um, it didn't get in that ad because he just decided to put this out very quickly. So oh, yeah. It, um, so uh, I almost got in the wire, at least mentioned, <laughs> but in the ad anyway, but I don't know. We'll see if they do a review. Maybe they will. Who knows? All right. Well, this has been a good introduction section. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, we've covered a great sense of grand. There's a few, probably the biggest thing I think we wanted to talk, though, was DIY origins and upbringings. Oh, sure. Taking Absolutely. All the way back to your time studying composition with Donald Keyes, mm-hmm. 
Quinn Baker at the University of Denver's Lamont School of Music. Where, what was that experience like? How did you kind of realize that it was your mission to bring new music to the masses? Oh yeah. So, um, gosh, let me think about school stuff here. Um, yeah, when I went to school, I was kind of, um, I guess a little bit naive about how the music scene worked like in, on a national or inter international level. Um, so I, I went there initially to study, um, commercial composition. So my, my background was like, Oh, kind of shred guitar stuff to be honest, um, <laughs> in the nineties or whatever. That's sick. Um, and that was a thing actually, like in the, in the mid to late nineties, a lot of the people who were studying composition around the country, like folks that I met from all over the place kind of came from that background. Like we all, interesting. um, I guess just were playing like obnoxious instrumental shred guitar stuff. Uh -huh. And then we're like, there, there must be something more <laughs> because this is okay. really kind of blah and dull after a while. Yeah. Um, was plus, it plus like, it's like, had, I'm just curious. So at that point, had you heard like the Ascension or Naked City? Was there something kind of coming off of that? That was a big, yeah, that, that's right. Yeah. So the beginning of my, I guess, getting exposed to maybe more diverse or interesting music um, kind of came from, um, well, the shred thing kind of leads you to like Frank Zappa. Yeah. Um, and then, I remember Guitar World magazine mentioned something about Bill Frizzell working with this madcap John Zorn uh -huh. or whatever. And um, so that's actually why I picked DU. Um, Wynn Baker, um, who ran the jazz department there, and I did some composition studying with him as well, um, had been roommates with John Zorn um, during a brief period where Zorn was going to, um, I think he was in Eugene, Oregon, uh, doing an undergrad thing. And so Zorn being you know, notoriously very, very busy and also not interested in like really talking shop with mm -hmm. people, um, I figured that was the closest I was going to get to maybe picking somebody else's brain about what was in John Zorn's brain when he was uh -huh. figuring this stuff out. So that's kind of why I went there, um, which did work. I mean, he, he did have some things to say about, um, especially the really early period of Zorn's stuff. Um, when he, when he left Eugene, he went back to New York and that was kind of the era where, um, some of those game pieces came together and Locust Solus and things like that. There, there were a little more outside, um, uh -huh jazz meets no wave kinds of things happening at that point um so he had some insight into that stuff and into books in fact to tie it back into music library stuff he he knew of um there's this book called new sounds for woodwind that zorn uh, it, originally that book was written for like flute and clarinet and oboe if i remember right and zorn applied the techniques in there to saxophone and was like sitting down meticulously creating this chart of like alternate fingerings to get like microtones and different sounds um, that you can't conventionally get out of a saxophone and spent most of his time in, in Eugene just like practicing a ton of that material um, to the point that um, you can hear it on a lot of his records too, like where certain notes pop out and just sound very different than all the surrounding notes. It's because he's using these very weird fingerings that he had developed uh -huh. based off of this uh, Bizzotti book. And so uh, we have that book at the Poly Music Library too, which is kind of funny because it's an old, old book. I think it was the newest version of it is like a republishing from like the mid 60s or something. So um pretty obscure um that book has a record in the back as well too like kind of fun so, so is, it, is it like an oversized or it's just literally lp sized with the um it's well it's a little i think it's like a 10 inch record so i think the book's like maybe i want to say like 10 by 12 something like that it's mm -hmm. not huge huge but um but yeah you can hear some of that stuff in action at least with like flute and carnet and oboe um but yeah zorn sort of took those things and, and ran with them um but i was still kind of i guess naive about like how the music scene nationally worked for some reason i had it in my head that like I don't know, like John Zorn is a, a superstar or like, yeah. um, he's on par with, I don't know, um, <laughs> the faith no more, whoever was popular at the time, you know, in the yeah. late nineties, like, mm -hmm. no, um, it, it's just so odd because of the like commercial crossover that he yeah. did compared to other people. So that's even how I would have known him from that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was like years, years later when I first got to, to New York, when I was playing some shows out there and we went, walked past the stone and got a chance to like kind of just peek our head in like at the original location. Um, and it's so tiny, right? Like I had no idea. Like the room I'm in is like twice as big as the stone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, there, there's nothing to it, you know, which is cool. I mean, it's great that all this stuff is happening, but I guess I just, for some reason I had it in my head that, um, that music had this like huge demand behind it or something, which is totally fine that it doesn't. Um, cause I think what it has is community, which is even more important, you know, at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, I ended up changing my, my major pretty quickly after I got there. Um, I met one of the other reformed shredder guys who was studying composition and the first day, this stuff sounds so nerdy to, to talk about, but 
Um, we were driving around, it must've been like 1995 or 96 or something, um, cranking uh, Henry Gretzky's second string quartet in his car. And I was like, this is awesome. And like, I changed my major to classical composition the next day. Oh, sick. Um, just from hearing that piece. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, went on to listen to all kinds of that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, it's an interesting background to have as far as um, it gives you the the technical ability to know how to write pretty much anything you want to hear. Certainly anything coming from conventional instruments. Yeah, I mean, you need to know, you know, orchestration, what instruments are capable of doing well, you know, what's idiomatic to instruments, mm -hmm. what what they struggle with playing, um, what they'll get mad at you if you hand them something that's, you know, impossible or very cruelly on the edge of possibility for them to play, things like that, you know, so you can learn you know, how best to achieve what you want to hear uh -huh. um, without making other musicians irritated, I guess, while they're trying to learn it. Um, and just, you know, hearing with, with like 20th century classical music, they could do anything, you know? I mean, really, you can go pull, especially like post-World War II classical music, every record is, it reminds me of the tape scene, honestly. I mean, every time you, you get a tape in the mail, like, you know, I never listen to stuff ahead of time on Bandcamp or whatever. Like, I just, it shows up, I pop it in, and I consider it just sort of like, a surprise you know i want to uh -huh. be genuinely surprised by whatever happens and that's really what like a lot of post-world war ii classical music is like too like you put the record on even by the same composers a lot of the time like uh say somebody like uh Zanakis or stockhausen or something like their records can be dramatically different from album to album like everything uh -huh. they're working on is its own thing and it's done within the parameters of that thing and then they move on and do something else and I love that. It's so interesting to uh, to be able to be so creative and just like have an idea and take it, let it go where it wants to go, basically. Yeah. Um, so that I think that's really how that helped me a lot. And then um, I guess moving that into like um, underground music and DIY stuff, um, I guess it just becomes obvious once you realize what the audience size actually is. <laughs> yes. So okay. then you're like, oh, okay, I guess I'm DIY. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's cool. And that's fine. You know, I mean, that ended up being great, you know, because I mean, the alternatives are are kind of painful, I guess, to think about, you know, I mean, if a person were to to stay on like a, a conventional classical music track, um, I mean, that's great for some people, but I think I would have been a little bit frustrated or disappointed with it um, in terms of, you know, you're, you're always playing the same repertoire, like that nobody wants to try new things. Yeah. Um, and you're always worried about money, like, like half of your time is you know, begging people for money to maintain these gigantic institutions with lots of staff. And mm -hmm. that's not fun. You know, I mean, it's more fun to try to do things, you know, we're all scraping by doing things, you know, as cheaply as possible, usually losing money on stuff. I mean, you know, how it is with the tape label stuff too. I mean, mm -hmm. generally the goal is to like come as close as possible to breaking even. And that usually doesn't happen either, but um, and that's fine. You know, the, the main goal is getting the music out there. So, mm -hmm. um, and not having to answer to anyone and not having to worry about money. Like you just do it because it needs to be done. Um, those things I think are, are, you know, I cherish those. I think that stuff is maybe more important than, you know, getting stuck in some institutional kind of situation. Um, and you know, I can do a bit of that stuff at the library too. So I have, I kind of have my foot in both worlds, I guess, because I'm still certainly, you know, helping people with questions about conventional classical music and, and all kinds of music, really. Um, but I don't have to focus on that exclusively, basically. So I can use my my knowledge about those scenes without having to, uh, you know, get too invested in in the the less savory aspects of that stuff. I guess. Mm -hmm. So. Before the library, how did you end up connecting with other spaces, kind of outside that were DIY that also were not mm -hmm. conservatory? Because it seems like to me you made a very clear assumption in the nineties there of like, I'm not doing the conservatory path. I'm not going into that. I know I'm going to be doing DIY. And then how do you find that in places like, like in Nebraska? Um, well, it was harder before the internet. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a lot easier now. Um, yeah. You can find people almost instantly really. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, I think, well, the internet was, started to be a little bit of a, a thing in the late nineties, but for music stuff, um, you know, we were making websites and stuff like that too in the late nineties to try to get oh, the yeah. word out there. And mm -hmm. there weren't that many people on the internet yet. And so you, it, it wasn't that commercialized at that point. Mm -hmm. Um, so you could kind of find other weirdos, um, early on, but it was relatively limited. So yeah, most of it was just, um, finding venues that were open to trying new things. And so we would initially do things at small clubs, um, usually on weeknights, nights that they weren't, you know, that worried about, um, packing the place. Mm -hmm. Um, you try things like that. And then eventually that sort of parlays into house shows and stuff to you. Um, Bob Bucko Jr. In, in Dubuque, Iowa, I think for me is a really important aspect of that sort of thing. Um, Bob is so good. 
I have yeah. a couple of his. They're all hiding about it. Shout out to personal archives. <laughs> yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, personal archives is is fantastic. Every once a year, personal archives puts out like one or two things. I'm like, oh my god, guys. It yeah. always it really does shock me because they still very consistently send stuff to tabs out. And I kind of know it's like, okay, maybe what the hit range is gonna be, and then randomly he'll have like an incredible math rock tape or an incredible yep. jazz tape. And it's just mm-hmm. And even his own music, too. I mean, Bob is one of those people that kind of reminds me of those 20th century composers in a way, too. Like every record could have like they can be dramatically different from one another, but all like so high quality, you know, like Mm -hmm. um, he's got those uh, some of the older kind of guitar focused records will have some of the most beautiful. Oh, gosh, there's that one that has um, um, Amazing Grace with um, Somewhere Over the Rainbow combined into um kind of a medley thing that he's playing on solo guitar that's oh. just absolutely astonishing just gorgeous um i know a person here in lincoln who um because he plays since he's so close by he plays nebraska pretty uh-huh. frequently um i know one fellow that went to one of those shows that wants that played at his funeral like it's just such a beautiful recording um wow but then he put out like harsh noise um complex math rock stuff himself solo saxophone albums overdubs yes. like triple saxophone albums uh, anything. I mean, it's just absolutely astonishing. You know, the the depth and breadth that, that he can come up with are just oof, really, really amazing. It also so um, just mentioning that breadth it made me think of um, German Army as well. And I I know they have a personal archive, so they don't. That would boggle my mind. But Peter, Chris, or the individuals behind that, they just keep you know every like <laughs> six months, yep. you just get something from them, and it's like, oh my god, guys, how is this? this good even it was funny i was talking with um ryan masteller earlier this week and he was playing one of the releases they did in fact it's from the lincoln nebraska label if i recall perk 70 that's out there if they're oh you know i'm not familiar with them oh my god i don't know if they're maybe i'm getting interesting oh is it the expo 70 thing um i I think they i think they're in like kansas city or something if i remember right it's not it's not expo it's park 70 but yeah they might be kansas city that's what i think that's sounding right yeah and I didn't even realize when I had reviewed the tape, um, the color, it was, I forget the name, but it's one of those German army aliases. And it's just right. his ability to know which alias to use and what it's going to be the music for. Mm-hmm. Right. Peter Gris stuff is like all the Bradford worship to me. And it's some of the most brilliant stuff I've heard. I love the guitaring on those works. Yes. Oh, gosh. Yeah, there, that was an early Timbal thing, too. I think the second tape that symbol did was a peter chris um solo tape oh sick yeah i think one of the first ones or something i I can't remember there was two that came out well it's that's quite a discography to try to figure out chronology (laughs) (laughs) there's and just the Um, beauty of it is just you just hit one one just hits you and then you're part of the german army (laughs) yes oh gosh you know and that was one of those things too back when i was writing a lot of reviews um peter or yeah i mean i guess i technically know who, who it is now but we'll we don't need to go there i guess you but, don't need um, and i'm dm yeah. he's i know the last name he right. lives in san Fernando valley we've almost met up repeatedly for drinks like yeah you guys it's, are right it's just, it's just peter <laughs> yeah that's right yeah um they started just sending stuff randomly um when i was writing for tabs out i think and i i did cover a couple of them on there and on words on sounds i think too um initially i had this thought in my head like i really like the trajectory of the stuff that they're doing and i'm just going to cover everything they do and then i realized that i think they can actually record faster than i can write yeah <laughs> it's incredible but it's all really high quality and so it yeah, was like, I, I remember like when they had i want to say late 2021 early 2022 the random like strategic tape reserve release and i missed it and i think that's yes. a lot now and then yeah. mark masters quickly tweeted like there's some cabaret Voltaire going on here. Like, this is a really good development of their sound. And I'm like, how many releases do these guys have? And like, how do you just know that? Yeah. Mark? <laughs> yep. It's true. It's, it's just wild. It, it's humbling, honestly. Um, the, yeah, the sheer quantity and the high quality going on through that whole, uh, I mean, and, and the, you know, the background of like, just, you know, bringing attention to cultures that have, have been compromised by modern modern life modernity um encroachment on um primitive cultures by commercialization Uh you know all all done instrumentally you know i mean it's fascinating that they can put all this music out that again like i I always find it really interesting when people can have these conversations about music um without actually needing to be explicit about what they're talking about it's kind of implicit in what they're doing 
Um, all they have to do is name the album after a, a, a culture that's struggling with something or, or a lost culture mm -hmm. and name some of the songs after some of that stuff. And, you know, I end up looking that stuff up and I'm like, wow, this is, you know, you learn a lot of stuff about them as you're listening. And that's just such an important role, I think, to play. And once you start looking at the totality of that body of work, wow, I mean, that's a real service to humanity, honestly, that they're doing. Mm -hmm. It's unreal. Yeah. That's just a really sincere kind of like, I've heard the term and I got to go back and read the Mark Fisher essay on it, but probably to me, the one thing I've really taken away from his works as I've gotten older, it's the idea of sonic road mapping. Yes. And he uses that specifically to talk about dub music and the dub that he really points to it's um, Pole from Berlin and then mm. Burial in South London. And he notes, it's like, both of these artists use dub in really different ways, but it was very much just music about that immediate environment to them. Right. And I was really, as soon as I had heard that phrase, I was like, this is, this is the music I love. This is why I guess I'm really deeply attached to like, or why German army, some of those releases totally just go somewhere for me because right. the song, that element of just taking a sonic road mapping or using the very small fragments that you can get with liner notes or with song titles and getting something there. Yep. Absolutely. Well, wow. yeah, I'm trying to think of when we were talking about, um, I guess influences and DIY stuff to you. I, I mean, for me, I think once I got out of school, it, it was kind of a, a combination of, um, download blogs honestly helped a lot too just like learning about other scenes that had been out there that i hadn't been exposed to even in school like things that you know we all kind of missed you know yeah um, just like the say the 70s locked jazz scene in new york something like that where mm -hmm. you know a lot of the records that came out on that scene nobody outside of new york would ever have known about them they're like you know pressed in quantities of like 50 or 100 i mean you know if it weren't for blogs like those things just basically would have disappeared and you know you start yeah. hearing about all these things that had happened and then you kind of realize that you're surrounded by other people that are all doing things kind of on that level, um, that you all have interesting music going on, that you're working on things together. Um, you meet other people like in, in Nebraska, um, public eye store was a big deal. Um, Brian day was a huge influence. He uh -huh. he's originally from Iowa, lived in Omaha and then in Lincoln for quite a while as well. And, um, so his whole, um, the, the, again, the depth and breadth of the public eye store records catalog is just fascinating. I mean, I learned about, um, like from that scene, lowercase improv, I think was the, the big takeaway for me, um, which is still a pretty large portion of my listening habits or our lowercase improv stuff. Um, it's just such an interesting way to, to think about music. In fact, a lot of Jay Kramer's music kind of tends toward lowercase too. A lot of it's like very quiet gestures. Um, it's not people doing, um, I don't know what you would call it. I mean, lower, I guess lowercase is the right name for it because it's sort of, almost like the conceptual opposite of harsh noise, but the same audience basically. <laughs> so um, it works out really well. And, you know, thinking about those things and um, places to do them, like you can't do lowercase improv in a, in a club, really. It just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. it's, it's too dang loud. Everything is overwhelming it. And so those end up being house shows that are these very quiet, gentle kinds of audiences just to make those things happen. Yeah. Um, so the, those things, I think sometimes the music almost dictates, you know, kind of how the scene is going to go around it. Um, and yeah, we still have a lot of interesting folks. Um, oh gosh, some of the interesting folks locally, we've got um, uh, Jeff Bachoven uh, performs his dream journal. Um, they just put up a new album on Bandcamp last Friday. That's really good. Um, they actually used to run another Lincoln cassette label called Fantastic Cassettes. And about five years ago, for a couple of years, they actually had a cassette store open downtown. Um, wow. It was up in, um, we have this area of like a uh, second floor of like art galleries and stuff, um, kind of like right at the center of downtown 14th and O streets is kind of the, the epicenter area. Um, and for a couple of years, that was a really fun thing just to, to be able to go up and actually like they got in some underground cassette label cassettes, as well as just some used tapes and stuff like that too, from all over. Mm -hmm. Um, they sold like cheap little cassette Walkmans and stuff. So that people can't, that came in and couldn't be like, Oh, well, I haven't had a cassette player in 50 years, like five bucks. You can use a cassette player. Like, yeah, it's just great. Um, fun stuff like that happening. Um, yeah, those Omaha folks too. Um, Kyle Jessen up in Omaha is doing like some super heavy improv stuff these days. He just had a record that came out on, um, Oh gosh, I'm not thinking of the label now. One of the big New York improv labels. Um, he's had a few cassettes that have come out of like kind of free improv stuff in the last few years too. Um, 
but yeah, there's a, a quite a bit of a scene that's still happening and there's always things that have been happening. I mean, it's, it's, uh, being in the Midwest, I think, isn't as much of a, a death sentence as maybe the coastal folks think it is, I guess. So, I don't think so. Um, yeah, there's a lot going on. I mean, we we definitely have fun. And, um, you know, I think there's some aspects of, of Midwest living that maybe make that music kind of more interesting in some ways, too. Uh-huh. Um, you know, it's the cost of living is relatively low here. Uh-huh. Um, so you don't have as much like financial stress a lot of the time, um, which I think can help some folks. And you just kind of have some room to spread out too, like. I know anytime I'm in a place like, well, New York comes to mind or whatever, I guess, where, I mean, I feel like just like walking up the street in New York to, to like buy a sandwich is more stressful than living in Lincoln, you know, I mean, Mm -hmm. it's, it's intense, you know, everything, everything takes tremendous effort and there's a lot of people to cut through and, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's just so much, um, competing for your time and energy and money and stuff in those places and here. Um, things can be a, a little bit more introspective, I think, in some ways. So, so that probably helps our scene to some extent. I think. Awesome. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Well, Thomas, did you have anything? No. Well, oh. Oh. I was just wondering, Thomas, did you have any questions there? Oh, oh no, I think we covered everything in that section. Okay. The only the only final thing, I guess, on top of that is. What kind of got you into that world of the libraries there, 2017 to 2019? You mentioned you joined in 2019. So how did you yeah. take that plunge? Um, well, the job came open, <laughs> basically. Oh, okay. um, so I had been, um, when I was at the Talking Book and Braille service, um, I had initially started that job um, just with like my background in classical composition because mm-hmm. they run a couple of recording studios. Oh, and um, basically um, they record like, primarily books either about Nebraska or by Nebraska authors, and then a whole bunch of magazines that are related to Nebraska topics and stuff, Mm -hmm. sports and farming and whatever. Um, And so there's volunteers that come in to do the narration and then staff does the recording and there's a whole workflow of um, producing the recordings and stuff. In fact, um, that stuff ties into the cassette culture in some interesting ways too. Um, The classic C1 uh, cassette player that a lot of people use to manipulate tapes and stuff, those, those big beige, uh, cassette players and stuff yeah. those are the original cassette players for talking book um services oh, all over the country oh wild yeah so those are yeah i was around those things in fact that was when i was the most surrounded with cassettes in my life I mean, we had pretty close to a, like a literal million cassettes in That's the insane. basement of a building um that went out to people because all that stuff crazy. was still circulated on cassette until like 2008 or so wow wow yeah, That's I, mean, crazy. I started in 2005 so um yeah, it was just tons. Of, and then we had a long transitional period. So we didn't really get rid of tapes completely until 2013 or so. Um, so it was a lot of tapes. And I, I learned a lot about tape duplication because we would always, you know, tapes break and you'd have to repair tape number five or whatever, mm-hmm. fix things like that. Um, but yeah, while I was there, I ended up going back to get a master's in library science. Oh, um, yeah, so that was kind of the transition. Um, I hadn't really planned on leaving there because I really loved that job. Um, And I loved what we did and how it served people there. Um, I ended up becoming, I started as like the circulation and audio production coordinator. And then the, our our director retired and I became the director for the last about four or five years that I was there. Um, And then, yeah, this job came open. Um, Basically the, the Pauline music library had had um, one librarian named Carolyn who had run the whole thing since it opened Mm -hmm. um, in 1982, I believe it was. And um, she retired. So um, when I saw the job pop up and I was like, oh, my gosh, that would just be such a great way to to like um, combine my interests in, in working at libraries as well as music stuff. And, you know, I already have this background in classical music, but um, I think the 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 fact that I've kind of um, worked in a, f- a few different musical areas over time is sort of helpful because, you know, people have questions about all kinds of different musical things um, that, you know, some are, are questions related to classical music or, you know learning piano the you know the usual sorts of stock things that come up Uh um but people also have questions about you know record collecting djing you know things that are not usually thought of as like traditional music library boundaries or whatever but are very much part of you know what it is to be a musician these days i mean we have tons of folks that come in that don't read sheet music for example which is totally fine um i do push it a teeny tiny bit (laughs) when it's when i can um, but you know, I, you don't need to read cheap music to be a fantastic musician at this point. And tons mm-hmm. of folks are coming in that their instrument is the laptop, you know? And so there's no, yeah. 
there's no reason to read sheet music for that stuff. So, um, but yeah, we try to have lots of resources for those things too. Um, and yeah, I try to just stay abreast of whatever's happening. Um, like we have the, so far there's only been one book on Vaporwave, but I picked that up and, you know, I'm conversant enough in Vaporwave to talk about that with folks. And sick. I, again, I think the cassette background helps with that stuff too. Of like, you know, I have some of these like crazy expensive, valuable yeah. Yeah. tapes and stuff. So um, they weren't expensive when I got them, but uh, yeah, yeah, they were, uh, they're just showed up in the mail and now they're apparently like collector's items. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's fun to talk to people about that stuff and how it develops and, um, and to let them know, you know, most of all that whatever they come in with, they're, they're not alone. Like the, there are other people interested in what they're interested in. And, um, I hope, you know, through the library that they can not only find resources that will help them, but realize that, you know, there's going to be other folks in town that are interested in what they're doing too. And, you know, hope to continue to, to spark those collaborations, whether they're local or, or again, finding people, um, as, as we often do, you know, through, through the internet or, or whatever too. So. Two probably final questions or thoughts on this library stuff really comes down to the yeah. the collection to me. Yeah. Um, why should a physical or why should a public library invest in a physical media CD collection or on top of the books? Because I I oh, almost see at times this disconnect in especially right now with some public libraries making big investments or like there's a lot of great music books coming out right now and mm -hmm. getting music books, but then failing their patrons on having CDs that are able to immediately connect to that? Well, that is a good question. So the, the, technically my, like my budget, it's kind of an interesting situation where the, the music library is funded through a private trust that was established by oh. Lillian Helms Polly, um, who was a, a teacher and opera singer uh, that lived in, lived in Lincoln. She taught in a few different places. Um, and so the trust kind of dictates what sorts of things I can buy. Um, which are mostly book related type resources. So um, as far as the CD budget, um, that still comes out of the main the main city's library budget. Um, but that is an interesting question because the like so most of the CDs I play on the radio show um, are not from the library. <laughs> Those yeah. are for me um, for the most part. Um, I do try to pull library ones whenever I can, though, too. Um, that's a tricky situation, though, because we have been talking about the long term. Um, plans for the cd collection you know i mean there's so much that you miss in terms of liner notes especially again like to bring up classical music i i mean there could be you know we might have five to ten recordings of, of especially popular classical repertoire right and done by different conductors different symphonies um different eras maybe even the same ensemble sometimes but like a say like chicago symphony is redone um stravinsky several times things like that um Gosh, even even string quartets and stuff like the the Juilliard quartets done the Schoenberg quartets I think three times now I think we've got two of those recordings. Um, they're different. I mean, there's different things about them, and the liner notes tell you different things about them. Mm -hmm. But when you're dealing with like streaming music, the metadata for all that stuff is gone, right? Sure, so I mean, yeah. there's just not much that you can learn about them, um, and it kind of is part of the music in a way. I mean, does it, does it have to be part of your experience? Eh, not necessarily, but it, it can be helpful for sure. Um, I'd rather have too much information than not enough. Yeah. And so that's, that's kind of the struggle there. Um, but yeah, long-term, I mean, CD usage is kind of dropping, um, everywhere. I mean, yeah, a lot of folks just don't have CD players at this point. So, which is, uh, which is funny that I'm releasing a CD now. That's pretty sweet. Um, but yeah, what are you going to do? I mean, they don't have any physical media, right? I mean, a lot of the people buying records don't have record players either. So, that's true. um, it's just a strange thing that's happening, but um, so, I mean, streaming music is definitely the future. I, we do have um, access to, like, say, some databases, like Alexander Street has um, a set of uh, different databases of recorded music that are interesting. Um, like, the cool. most of the Smithsonian Folkways recordings are available through there, for example. Oh, nice. um, so I do pay for that. Yeah. Um, that can help a bit. Gosh, you know, the long term, I mean, I'm not sure what's going to happen with it. Uh, to some extent, the, that's a question that's probably going to answer itself, because if the CD market commercially continues to shrink they're just not going to make them you know and so um as far as like getting a robust collection of cds we're kind of probably going to lose out on it whether we stop buying them or they stop making them um because both will probably happen roughly simultaneously so um yeah that is an uh, it's a problem for sure um, it's definitely, yeah and i think again the reason i mentioned that it's like the liner you know stuff comes to mind the right it's not that streaming is bad as much as there is a fixed quality with that CD that you're getting yeah. big mm -hmm. experience mm -hmm. that yep. to me has always been, it's like, well, we, we did that. 
why would you sacrifice or go to streaming for that? Mm-hmm. But then this is maybe why I kind of wanted to ask about streaming is like, do you have with the library these really interesting opportunities to create library music platforms? Specifically, I kind of saw it on the website there, or at least host an archive of local music. Something yes. that at least leverages streaming into the digital um, public space or into a library's mission beyond just access to a resource, but community resource, really. And exactly. Is, is that possible? Do you see um, the music library there kind of doing a streaming service that really reflects Nebraska music? What's going on? Yeah, I, I have a longer range project right now. This kind of depends on what happens with um, locations and stuff. I mean, they're they're kind of reassessing our needs of whether we'll um, maybe get a, a new downtown facility built sometime in the next decade or or some of the other branches will get expanded. I'm, I'm not sure how that stuff's going to shake out yet, but um, wherever that happens, I'm kind of waiting to move on this next project to do that because part of it's going to be physically tied to the building. Um, but my my vision for that would be a combination of some digital and physical resources um, that would have like, say, information kiosk type um, elements in it. Um, so we could have like we have a few um, organizations that could combine um, resources that already have existed. So like, for example, in Nebraska, we had um, uh, Star City Scene was a website that existed for a good chunk of the aughts into the teens that had um, kind of a, a history of Nebraska music uh, that was pretty updated up to the point that they stopped. Um, when they stopped, there was another organization called Here Nebraska that took over some of that work. Um, they kept things updated until pretty close to recent history, about 2014. So now we're getting at least within a decade range. Um, there was another website called, um, what is it called? Yourbandbrokeup.com, I think it was, or thebandbrokeup.com, which was basically recordings of CDs that people just uploaded themselves uh, from the Nebraska That's and sick. Omaha, basically Lincoln and Omaha scene, but some mm-hmm. outliers in Nebraska too. Um and then we have the Nebraska Music, um, I'm forgetting what they call it now. I think it's just called Nebraska Music Hall of Fame now. And they give awards to different um, notable musicians over time and have kind of a website as well as doing some in-person events. So my my thought is I want to take some of those resources, some of which have been taken offline, but I'm in touch with the people who have the, the data from those sites, um, as well as some books about Nebraska music history that already exist. Um, there's one called... Uh, uh, till the cows come home that's especially good up until about the late 80s um if i can combine all those resources somehow along with um, whatever recordings i can get access to um, maybe some ephemera ticket stubs photos of venues things like that um, and combine those into a resource so that people could use them both on a website they could stream things mm-hmm. um plus we could have like a kiosk in-house that you could um kind of click through to things you know so like if you were listening to a song um you could look at the album art maybe a actually like thumb through the you know cd jacket or whatever i could get access to um in some sort of a digital kiosk format um maybe click on a ticket and zoom in and look at like be like oh it was like 50 cents to go see a show in 1985 or whatever like stuff like that would be kind of cool um yeah so that's that is kind of a long-range plan um it does take some money to do so it'll Uh um i'll probably have to do a little bit of um searching for some funding to to pull that off um, but I have talked to most of the shareholders who have pieces of that puzzle as far as the data goes, and they're all on board with doing something. And so I think Polly would be a, a logical place to kind of centralize that information um, and keep it safe for a longer period of time. Because, I mean, someone could do it, um, you know, commercially or outside of the library um, environment and do a good job with it, I'm sure. But then there's always just the question of what happens to it long term, like, um if I have it in the library, it's much less likely to just, you know, vaporize completely. So um, if there's a budget cut or something, so mm-hmm. it exists and they'll be like, okay, we're not going to, we're not going to destroy it at our, you know, here it is. We already paid for it. Let's just keep, you know, keeping it online is just a matter of paying the electric bill at that point. Not mm-hmm. so much a matter of, uh, you know, continual, continual investment. So that's my hope anyway. Sick. Really? Yeah. And I really wanted to tape a uh, dispensing device at one point. <laughs> that would be sick <laughs> too. Was, oh man, there there was this article a few years back. I think Tabs Out even covered it, um, where there was this store in Omaha that had converted one of those old cigarette vending machines into being like a thing where you could um, sell tapes out of it. And that machine was in Omaha, and that store went out of business a couple years mm-hmm. ago. And that machine is still in Omaha somewhere. And I am trying to find it and figure out if I can get it to Lincoln and do something with it. Because it's already been converted to be like a cassette vending machine. Like, how cool would that be? 
that would be super sick. I actually saw, yeah. I think it was on TikTok recently. Um, it wasn't cassettes, but this person like goes around just like old abandoned malls, you know, or not like abandoned, but like, you know, malls that like are not a mall anymore. It's like, there's like mom and pop shops in there. Like kind of okay. like, yeah. So it's like dead malls, I guess that's what it is. And, uh, there's like a few vending machines in this dead mall that were just selling like old video games, like N64, um, yeah, like Game Boy games and stuff like that. And it was just like in a vending machine. Um, yeah, pretty sick. I guess similar concept to like cassettes. But yeah. Yeah. I've yeah, seen like the vending machine. I know that one. Yeah. It was it was one of the top voted posts on cassette culture ages ago. Oh, that's sick. Yeah. In in a random mall, and it's like you just get the Batman tape here. <laughs> Dude, that's yeah. like super cool, actually. That's like a really cool concept. I feel like, yeah, yeah that'd be really cool in like an amoeba or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, I w- I wish you know, and knowing that this one machine at least like has already been you know converted, they've done whatever mm-hmm. stuff logistically that had to be done. Yeah, like it's just like probably languishing in some <laughs> warehouse or something now. Like I just want to go find that dang dude. Thing. Track <laughs> like, it down, nearby. track it down. Yeah. That'd be so sick. Bring it back to yeah, life. It's got to be nearby. Yeah, I could just like run a truck and haul it back here, and then figure out what to do with it later. Like just knowing it's yeah like, for sure the potential for it would be. I mean, that could be a fun library thing too. Maybe I don't know. I mean, who knows? There could be some fun like putting it outside of the library or something. So after, yeah. after hours, you need a little music, like pop in a dollar and get a tape or something. Like, yeah. It's like the red box, <laughs> but for yeah. cassettes. I've yeah. seen in San Diego County, one of the systems, San Diego County library, not San Diego public, San Diego County system has random 24 seven remote kiosks that distributes books and DVDs, yeah. you know, major popular titles. Oh, that's sick. Like a vending machine. Yeah. But that to me is just genius. Like, mm-hmm. And even just to see that for, yeah, like it would kill an amoeba instead for of sure. just another CD rack or something where it's just, mm-hmm. oh, just put in a $10 bill or, you know, scan right. my credit card and type in the digits and get my copy. Yeah, definitely. Would, the novelty of that or just kind of like doing that, I think is very fun. Yeah. Yeah. Things to make like, because physical media, I think um, for folks who weren't raised with CDs and stuff, um, streaming is just normalized, you know, and so, and that's totally cool. Um, but I think to, to get some folks interested in the potential of physical media, sometimes having fun things like that, or, you know, something that makes it novel or interesting can maybe help to inspire folks. Although again, we're seeing like, you know, with the vinyl resurgence, certainly a lot of folks, I'm I'm seeing multiple articles now talking about like 50% of the people buying records don't actually have a turntable at all. Um, which is fascinating to me that like they're, they're buying it, you know, partially to support the artist and partially Uh just because it's like a beautiful art object of sorts, you know, I mean, you can, Maybe they are still reading the liner notes, you know, but they're not reading them while they're listening to the record. They're listening to the stream or whatever. You know, it's just, yeah, that's cool. I mean, whatever works, that's totally cool by me. So that's really it. I think it's just a great, it's a great way to connect people to something that they wouldn't consider otherwise. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And again, it's like my dream just to go to one of those vending machines and you see all the band, like at the band camp store in Oakland, that would be killer because Dude, that's that'd really be sick. Spot. Mm-hmm. You would be able to say, oh, it's the new Hasu Mountain title next to the new Moonglit. And under no other circumstances, anybody going to go to a vending machine and be like, yeah, I want. They're not going to know that usually. Yeah. Right. But to have, especially with the context where it's apparent, that would be a dream. That would be a utopia. <laughs> For sure. That'd be yeah. really cool. Yeah. Bandcamp should do that. That's a great idea. I forget that they have an office. <laughs> like They seem like a... Um... I know, just an entity. Yeah, like a cloud or something. Yeah. I, don't know. Like, I, yeah, I almost visited it when I was up in San Francisco, but didn't. And I just knew what would happen is I'd spend dozens of dollars on the titles that they get in there. Yeah, and it's cool. Sure. Really glad that they have that shop and that they, you know, figured yeah. out how to curate and taste make those labels mm-hmm. a bit to like do that, kind of sustain something. Yeah. It's good. Totally. I guess though. Okay, we've gotten through basically everything. We've killed every single dragon here. <laughs> so now we get to talk about with sigils. Oh, sure. Which, besides re-emerging online proper this year with the new Timble Tapes batch, I haven't had a chance to hear it. I'm just assuming it's beautiful, though. It batch. is. It totally is. <laughs> beat, that's right. And amongst that, we have a very dense and dutiful music project that dives into how previous cultures, previous societies have responded to pandemic. And the result right. is, is whip sig- sigils, which it's a concise, dexterous listen. That was the best way I could come up with it. You know that there's a lot of early music, west and east on it. But 
also it has it's got a very 2023 20, mixing and mastering and electroacoustic kind of tinkering job to mm-hmm. it there's even it some drum machines that i was like there's a bit of a trap note here that's cool yep. and totally. again it's distinct i think it's distinct composer music that isn't out of place next to any of the arvo Zylo stuff any of the noise projects there are kind of even a little bit it's not lo-fi but ecm new music like this was a library donation that we passed on. So I got to take it home for free. Oh, sweet. Sick. Yep. Was, that, so, was that Parrot there? I couldn't. That was, um, yeah, it's Arvo Parrot with the Perfect. tape. It's great. Yes. There's Let's definitely a, a Parrot influence on, especially the first track, um, has some Gretzky and Parrot influence for sure. I'm slowly learning that stuff time by time. And it, it shocks me because of the, with Brian McBride's passing, I just got the first Stars of the Live they did for Cranky. Well, the oh, right. music for Nitrous Oxide. And I love, I really yeah. love their 90s stuff more than the the later stuff. It's great, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. Um, music for Nitrous Ox or not Nitrous Oxide, um, Desire for Aquatic Life, the paired, the paired influence is really, really there in yeah. a way I don't think I'd ever noticed until listening to those <laughs> and then. But mm-hmm. um, I hear bits of that on there. I hear a bit of Constellation post-rock in that Godspeed yeah. vein, but very much of just the Hotel to Tango collective and what mm-hmm. they were doing at yep. the turn of the century. And really just this is super super dense nerdy beautiful fun work this is an <laughs> incredibly easy to listen for what seems like a very high concept thing and how was again the process to assemble that composition was in your mind that like a set length or kind of writing process that you were pushing towards over three years yeah um so it started it started as i haven't told anybody this yet so i guess we'll get an exclusive here so my very first thought related to it was like in March of 2020, I was trying to think of things to do with the library to still communicate with the public through social media and stuff Uh at the library. So I was going to make a post. I was like, I wonder what has happened in music history that would be relevant to kind of what we're all going through because we were just about to be sent home for a while Uh um, as it was most of the, most of the world. And um, so I started kind of just looking into like, was there any music that we know of related to pandemic specifically? First, I looked at like, um, 1920s america with the influenza pandemic Mm -hmm. um there's not a ton of music about that either which i was kind of bummed about actually there's i think there's like one song that's like a 1921 influenza blues song Mm -hmm. or something but not enough to really go on so so i went further back and i found um in the medieval era a couple different rounds of groups of self-flagellants who had songs um you know the Monty Python routine where the they kind of have the monks walking around singing and then bashing themselves in the head. Yeah, that's kind of like a parody on what what had happened in, for real for real basically. Um, yeah. So they they had um, the, the Germans uh, specifically in 1349, um, which was the year the 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 biggest spread of the plague kind of went all over Europe and mm-hmm. into Scandinavia. Um, had these uh, these songs called Geyser Leader uh, or whipping songs is what mm-hmm. it translates to. Um, there are kind of two subsets of them. Some of them are for traveling, like walking from town to town. And then some of them are ritual songs that you sing, like while they kind of would like surround a church and sing these songs and self-flagellate and it would be kind of a spectacle. So like um, the the intention was to get like the townspeople to come out and kind of see what was going on. And they were basically asking they're like rituals of penitence, basically. They were, they were thinking that like, maybe if we, just, you know, beat ourselves up before God and apologize for being a terrible society that he'll make the plague go away or something. Mm-hmm. Um, when in fact, they were probably actually helping to spread the plague because they were walking from town to town and, you know, so uh, oopsie daisy. <laughs> but um, so it goes with those things. But anyway, they had some music and there happened to be um, one town that they went to, a priest that was fluent with uh, writing music in the pneumatic notation system of the time, managed to jot down six of their songs. And so that's what we have from the Germans. And then before that, um, in the 13th century, like mid 1200s or so, there was an Italian group called the Disciplinati who also had a set of songs and were also self Um, So there's not a lot of recorded music out there. Um, these tend to be very short pieces. They're just um, refrains basically for for. Uh, walking along or singing like they'll just be like two to four lines of music for each piece so they're very mm-hmm. short um so i wanted to use them um they're almost kind of like um a sentence if you will you know or, or a phrase and so my my thought with the sigils part of whip sigils was that i was going to take these these really short pieces 
and then kind of treat them like a uh, like you would a, a sigil in ritual magic or something where you take a sentence and reduce it into sort of a letter shape and then that shape represents a, an idea um these i kind of treated similarly where i took the melodies and condensed them or modify them in various different ways where um, some of the pieces do it through um, reharmonization. Um, some of them do it through counterpoint. Uh, the third piece, in fact, has a ton of counterpoint written over it. That stuff's uh, trying to see if I have any sheet music handy here. So a lot of this stuff was actually written on paper and stuff too, because this is pretty nerdy stuff to uh, proceed through. But um, so I would start with like, oops, must be up here. Here we go. Got too many sheet music things floating around here. Yeah, so I would start with things like um, this, which is um, this is one of the German pieces. Same. Uh, nobody really knows how to note how how to read this stuff anymore. So I was reading a bunch of scholarly text as well to figure out how to how to decipher this stuff. Yeah. Oh my goodness. That becomes basically this sort of thing, and then, oh, that's and then that sort of thing. I reduce down to this is a modified version of the melody from that. Okay. And that gets turned into um arrangements like this so this is the first piece on the record um, oh sick out. so um yeah so stuff like that um e so each of these melodies i kind of took through weird things though the one that's the most sigil like i think is uh the fifth piece where i actually used a bunch of granular synthesis stuff so i took the melody recorded it using a really really ancient instrument um that i picked up recently in fact I'll just, if you got a second i can go grab this because it's kind of entertaining Here's yeah grab it uh, a kurdish tanber um which is a very unusual instrument has a curved top um that thing it was looks broken insane. hanging on the wall of a music store that went out of business uh, it's quite old it's probably it's at least 100 years old i can't tell exactly but i mean it even has evidence of like woodworms having been in it at some point when it was still in the middle east it's probably from like northern iraq or iran um wow but i've got it reset up to the two string sort of thing yeah um or three strings, I guess, because the top, the top is doubled. But so I recorded um, one of the melody for that piece um, on this thing and then put it through granular synthesis to sort of condense it down and make like a sound out of it rather than like a melody. Yeah. So I, the, that whole piece is sort of like distillations of the melody turned into sound, which then I replayed as a melody. And then then that's also being played on. Um, I don't know if you can see these back here, but there's like an electric saws and an oud that I use for most of this. And then I also. Um, modified a guitar um so like this i'm gonna redo this because i didn't do a very good job but i don't know if you can see all the extra frets on this thing um if i get it in the right light here oh um, so crazy this is, uh, so is it like microtonal or yeah so it's, it has um, a bunch of quarter tones in the turkish musical system oh, okay so, oh yeah so i guess to explain the concept of this thing um the the overarching concept that i had um started as kind of just it conceptually started as kind of thinking about how previous cultures had dealt with plagues um landing on the, on this italian and german music tradition but then as i looked into that some more i kind of was looking at the surrounding history of it and it became i think more informative of i guess that's the time period that we're living through now and that's why i ended up being motivated enough to like end up recording it and making it into a thing um was looking at say like what happened to the cathars who were um well so the, this whole area there, there's some liner notes in the um, CD that kind of explain um, what some of this stuff is too. In fact, maybe I'll just pull this up so I don't speak incorrectly here on these because I did a bunch of research to to make sure I got all these things kind of matched up. But basically, um, what happened with the Cathars were they they lived in this area um called occitania mm -hmm. um which was um in in medieval europe this is before the countries had the boundaries they have now yeah um this was like kind of the southern half of france the occitan valleys and the italian alps um most of monaco and then Ca the catalonia area in eastern spain and then the andalusia area which was in southern spain um what was interesting about these areas were they they were the places where tons of cross-cultural exchange was happening um between people with like jewish christian and muslim backgrounds which is huge. I mean, we, when we think about Western music history, we don't talk about the fact that there had been this giant cross-cultural exchange happening and that Western secular songwriting, like outside of church music, was very, very influenced by Middle Eastern music. Like that's really where it all started to come from. So when we talk about like um, the Trouvères and Troubadours in France or the Meisingers in Germany, the early um, songwriters outside of church, like the beginning of 
uh, songwriting today, like the Nick Caves of the medieval era or something or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, these folks had kind of a Middle Eastern influence and background mm -hmm. and music history sort of does, like the books I have in the library don't really talk about this much. And so that's why I kind of got motivated to, uh, to write a piece about it because what ended up happening was um, the church wanted to get rid of the Cathars who lived in, in the Occitanian area um, because they considered them heretics. And so the Albigensian crusade happened around 1209 to 1220, basically to exterminate them. Um, although modern research is sort of showing that that might've been kind of a pretense just so that the monarchies could take over those areas and they'd have the areas that they have now. Um, but the, like, like what you have in music, like language itself was affected by these changes. So like the troubadours in France wrote their poetry and sang in what they call, we now call lingua de Oc, uh, the, which was the common language of the Occitan territories. Mm -hmm. Um, after the crusade, um, that stuff basically disappeared and now there's another language language to oil which developed into french language um and we lost language language to ac with the exception of uh, catalonia actually in spain still speaks it um but the language um this is what really stuck with me as a, as a touching point for all this stuff i guess was that um the the doc in the language signifies an area where ac or oc meant yes so in, in a very literal sense yes land was destroyed by this crusade right this this area that was very permissive and people all lived together in harmony mm -hmm. and amazing new creative things were happening because of all these people getting mm -hmm. along together that had different backgrounds um and we lost all that stuff and so that became kind of my big motivation was to um to document these pieces but to also document the middle eastern influence that we've written out of music history basically mm -hmm. that actually exists behind them so um, so that was kind of my motivation to actually make the the recording. So it's as far as like early music goes, I think if I um, handed this to an early music scholar, they're going to be kind of bewildered by what I've done to yeah. these pieces. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I wasn't trying to like be um, faithful to the original pieces so much as like use them as like kind of a, a starting point for discussion, really. And and those things are still happening today. I mean, we're still seeing the same things like politically in the United States right now, the idea of um, different groups of people not getting along or feeling like very isolated from one mm -hmm. another um, socially and politically. Um, it, I mean, it just goes to show these things happen over and over and over through history. Like yeah. apparently we never learned our lessons. So and the, the stuff that you mentioned here, I find again, super fascinating also because this is a great introduction to get to this music, but these histories you're talking about them getting lost. It's, I've even, when I was doing religious studies courses at UCSB, and we were talking about um, Asian, just East Asian Christianity, and it's like, there was Christianity out there in Asia at, you know, the 900s to the 1100s, and it's almost just right. kind of been taken out of the picture, just not discussed. But the remains are, are there. There's clearly a very flourishing religion going on here. Mm -hmm. And that kind of stuff doesn't get distilled and then through history it doesn't you have to re-excavate it even thinking right. about like i don't know the, the album evokes a little bit of dead can dance for me just because it's mm -hmm. going to that mm -hmm. same space of really taking you out of time going to something far back but updating it and right. and renewing the context renewing the emphasis and the beauty of that yeah yeah, yeah you got it man that's exactly what i was going for I, i'm definitely trying to like um yeah, make, kind of bring out the timelessness of the music and and also the timelessness of some of the, the extra musical, social and political issues that, again, continue to happen throughout history mm -hmm. um, in hopes maybe that we can eventually learn from them at some level. Yeah. You know? Oh, it's tough. I mean, I don't know if we ever will, but I mean, all you can do is try and keep recognizing that stuff. There's kind of a, a new thing um, with Dylan McConnell, who does all the art for the Temple tape stuff. Dylan had quite a year too. I don't know if, if you guys have talked about Dylan's whole thing, but he, um, is, it was kind of in a situation like German Army, I guess, where for many, many years, um, he was an artist of many names, but no one knew who, who all he was. But he sort of announced earlier this year that he's, um, he used Malone and Adderall Canyon yes. and Oxy. That, oh, that yeah. to me, it was funny because I had talked briefly with Jamie, Mike. And I think Ryan all knew, but also Jamie and Mike had had talked and because Mike had done the, the split of his right. stuff. <laughs> and it's just it's just yep. both his projects on, you know, the tape. Yep. And right. I think Ryan knew, but also just had never talked. And I was like, 
oh, the tiny little hammers guy did all this. This explains a lot. And we talked about the Adderall Canyon League in 2020. I thought that was a kick ass release from him. That's yeah. really the only one I properly heard, but I hadn't yeah heard like that he had reemerged all of a sudden, like yep. like doing after all these really solid pieces of art, reemerged yeah. to do a bunch of music in 2023. What's on the docket for him? What's, what's um so we've got a collab thing that's gonna be an EP. Um I think it's just gonna be called Chud after that old um sci-fi movie. Um it's basically <laughs> done, but I'm gonna redo my vocal parts on it. I I was trying to do this weird thing and I think I could do it better, so I'm gonna um using some weird effects on it and stuff. So um, but yeah, that'll be kind of fun. Oh gosh, he has so many, he's a whole bunch of other tape artists too. There were a couple years where like I, I swear like about 40% of the tapes that came out in like 2000. 12 13 uh-huh. somewhere in there were either dylan or the german army person oh um God. it's insane like yeah it's, it's totally insane. there there are others like um yeah so, several were on symbol yeah. he he went through all of the labels and he was in that that tabs out those tabs out lists are really critical to know like the top 20 of each mm-hmm. year just because you can see the friends or the partnerships and then realize like yeah oh, those people those guys are still kicking and like really leaped up to something. Yeah. It, it always like, it's yeah. kind of fine to see like, Oh, they, they really liked that JPEG mafia album <laughs> or they yeah. really, yeah, they really liked Eve's Malone and it, it's just tiny little hammers. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's remarkable. He, he is just incredibly talented. Um, I have never gotten to meet him in person either, but I guess he's going to be at a thing in Iowa city in a couple months that I'm going to try to run up to. And- that was sick. Um, finally get to meet him so i'm really excited about that but um yeah he he's again a great example of like the just the community around cassette stuff too like um well he's like a, a pretty substantial community himself when you consider how many email addresses he was maintaining there for a while <laughs> <laughs> he was yeah, yeah for a while he was like legitimately like keeping all those identities very separate as far as like yeah. marketing that stuff and so <laughs> Yeah, it was. I only found out accidentally after a while. I've I've known for quite a while, but it was it was just from him. Miss, I think he sent something from um another one of the oh my god, his, uh, <laughs> different yeah, Department of Harmonic Integrity is another one, um, which is another Timbal release. Mm-hmm. Um, that was I think he sent a use Malone thing under that email, and I was like, wait a minute, what's going on? Yeah, <laughs> so we went from there, but. Um, but yeah, he generally did a pretty good job of keeping them all in order. And um, and, and part of it was those, yeah, with 2020, it almost felt like that era just stopped. Just yeah. after the Adderall um, Canyon Lee, because I never was grabbing any Eves Malone tapes and that that last one on Timbal, that was in color. And it felt like a really great way for Timbal to go out with the color release. And yes, then- that's what I had been thinking. Yeah, mm-hmm. that was exactly my intent at the time was to just kind of retire it after that. But yeah, now it's... Um, I guess it's not retired. I've slown way down. I mean, this so this year, I guess we didn't mention those other two releases. So we did the Splunkers. Um, Alex Jacobson is a sound artist. He lives in Omaha. And this That's is the sick. first recording that he's put out um, in physical media anyway, which is really, really fun. So he's got two recordings on here, uh, one from 2021 and one from 2022. Um, and then Our Loop is a really interesting project. Um, we've done some stuff with Timbal that tends to have like spoken word stuff mixed with it. And so Our Loop yeah. is like a, a duo um it, this this tape is like the end of a triptych of tapes They've, they have two others out on two different labels as well um oh, and this yeah. is sort of the end of the story of, of those all those pieces although it can be listened to independently as well um just really beautiful music um i was just really taken by the the whole soundscape and um the story is really cool as well um they also did i think a like a 10 inch vinyl version of it too but the i like this tape version too but yeah so timbal is back it'll be a little bit slower than it was in the past because i do kind of have to um my energy level to prevent like flopping around with vertigo has to be under yeah. a certain level so yeah. i'm yeah. just doing a little bit at a time basically but um yeah i think we'll do a few more things with timbal next year too um and it might kind of turn more inward which is kind of interesting i you know so, so many of these tape labels kind of start as um, well, personal archives is a great example because of the name even kind of indicates mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Like they sort of start as vanity labels and then kind of expand outward from there. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm thinking Timbal might collapse in the opposite direction because um, I've never put anything of my own work on Timbal. It's always been again kind of an advocacy thing for other folks. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think next year, a, a couple of the collaborations I've been doing with other folks, like uh, this uh, irregular verbs project with Jay Kramer, 
Um, or um, recently I've done a couple of recordings with uh, Joseph Jaros, a phenomenal musician here in Lincoln, and mm-hmm. David Moscovich, who's done a couple of the kind of spoken word tapes on on Timbal. Um, they I joined kind of their project that they've had long term called Tiny Tiny Tongues. And uh, we've done a couple of recordings of that that I just need to do some editing on. So I think I That's might sick. actually be on a couple of Timbal recordings next year, which is kind of weird for me. Like I, it feels wrong <laughs> somehow to do that. I don't know. Cause I've always felt like it's about other people or something, yeah. but um, I don't know. Yeah. It's, it, they still won't be solo projects. I don't think I'm I, the solo stuff I'm working on. I have no idea what's going to happen with that music. I'm just going to do it and see if anybody wants it, I guess. Yeah. But, Damn. Yeah. That's a good conclusion. I think that's good. I think I might be a customer for that. <laughs> I need to get well, my writing. I need to get my writing digits back together because there's always great stuff there. And, yeah, the, the David, the David Moskovich stuff. I know he's still in that universe. There. I loved the Dada tape from 2020. That was oh, one of the so first like, real jumps into that world, and I was like, "Oh, this is great. We're gonna land perfect here." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he is. He is just such an interesting person too. He lives in Romania now. Oh, or, I'm sorry. Wow. Yeah, um, I'm wrong. Yeah, it's uh Portugal now. Portugal. Oh wow. Um, he is Romanian, but is in Portugal. But um, yeah, he is just a fascinating character. Um, he he grew up in Lincoln. Um, I didn't know him for a really long time. I've kind of met him through other folks, but um, honestly, like one of the most, you know how every once in a while you meet those people that you're just like, they sort of feel like they're eternal somehow or something. There's just something about him that's almost like immortal or something. He he very much has that kind of vibe or he's just uh, uh, this kind of curiously impeccable person. <laughs> he's like lovely to be around, very friendly as well, but also like kind of seems like you're talking to someone who could be like an animated Roman statue or something. It's pretty incredible. Um, so yeah, it's always fun to work with him. Wow. Um, and the things that come out of his mouth are just, um, he did, well, you've heard on the Dada thing. I mean, he does the sound poetry stuff where he'll, I, I can't even imitate that stuff where he'll kind of like break up yeah. just like, um, tiny little phonemes and repeat them in bizarre mm-hmm. ways where he, he sounds like a combination of like an auctioneer and a, um, like a priest speaking in tongues or something mm-hmm. combined just wow but he just like does that stuff and and still looks like as he's doing it he's just standing there very prim and proper and cool like it's just yeah. it's it's wild it's totally wild oh man. yeah very fascinating that's well, awesome thanks so much this has been super Thank fun you. yeah this was uh this was super sick this was a, a great time i guess like uh where can people keep up with all things scott shoals if they're interested in finding more i guess yeah um so the i guess the whip sigils record um if you just go to no part of it dot um you'll find that there as well as i should just talk about barbo stuff i mean he he has an incredible discography of material there. His, his music as well. Um, he just did a reissue of his three, three, three album, which is just an incredible piece of work that awesome. I recommend everybody check out. Um, then, uh, for Timbal tapes, it's just uh Timbal T Y M B A L cool. tapes.bandcamp.com. Um, I'll definitely keep stuff going on there. Um, and yeah, if you're interested in library stuff, um, I guess just look for uh, Lincoln city libraries online and you'll find a bunch of, uh, info on poly music library. Um, if you go to the staff recommendations area of our website, um, I do put a bunch of book reviews up there. You don't really see many music book reviews these days. And so that's kind of been, I think since I haven't been writing record reviews, that's been my new thing is writing book reviews. And so that's cool. kind of satisfy that itch and um, also just help to get the word out there about, about a bunch of music books. So there's yeah. somewhere around 200 ish book reviews on there now. So oh, sick. Um, that's a good place to look for those. Um, and yeah, otherwise I'm on all the social media thing of bobs, I guess. So dope dude well um we have one more question here it's kind of the base of the show maddie do you want me to take it do you want to take it i guess i'll take it if you want me to Thomas. you can if you want all right so this is a hypothetical here scott but you do you get this this album this machine ai learning album out and all the scots find out oh my god this guy's plagiarizing our our titles of our works unbelievable and the council of scott schultz's get together and they've decided as punishment that they're sending a white lab rat your way and that white lab rat has one goal it's going <laughs> to jump in your mouth and the only thing you can do scott is determine if that rat's going to jump in your mouth head first or butt first and why ooh boy <laughs> That was a great scenario, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking probably head first, just because it's it's going to be so agitated by all the other Scott Schultz's 
<laughs> motivating it forward, right? It's not going to have that extra step of turning around might take a minute. And uh, that, yeah, that's what that's yeah. what the rat's thinking too. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah, it's probably going to end up all the way down my throat before he even knows what happened. Really. Oh, so. oh. dude, that's honestly a really yeah. good answer. Yeah, it's like that's a straight yeah. meal right there. Yeah, no just, worries. No yeah. point. And the guy, the guy's okay um, with it. The Scots <laughs> accept this. <laughs> <laughs> it's I'll predestined i guess yeah what a great answer that's sick it's like we're gonna just eat the rat but like not in like a harmful way it's just gonna go straight down smoothly you know what i mean like no one getting crunched it's just like yeah quick. Right. that's right that's what i'm envisioning yeah just kind of a straight up rat swallowing um sick and almost an involuntary and a rat inhalation almost yeah yes. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Dude, that's awesome. That's beautiful. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, that's all we have for today. Thanks for tuning into TVD on KCSBFM 91.9 every Sunday, 4 to 6 p.m. and NetNet Radio every Wednesday at 7. This has been Scott Scholes from Timble Tapes. Thanks so much, Scott. Thanks so much for having me. This was so fun. Woo! <laughs>